Good morning, everybody. Um, great that you're uh, connecting with us this morning from all over the world. And uh, a warm welcome to Global Church and to all our friends that are tuning in today. What a great week it's been. It's certainly been a great week for Shelley and myself. We've become grandparents again for the second time. And so we've got uh, little Noah, our granddaughter, and now we've got Milo, our grandson. And uh, we're thrilled to bits. And we're so happy for Johan and Ellie. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the family's growing fantastic. And uh, I've also celebrated my 59th birthday. I've been on this planet 59 years. And uh, it sounds so old, does that? And yet I feel so young. And uh, I want to always have that youthful spirit. My mother was like that. She always had a youthful, she was always young in so many ways. And uh, I like being around young people. And heaven's gonna be full of young people. We're not gonna be old in heaven. There's not gonna be any old people. Did you know that? Only young people. And uh, you know, that, I'm saying we get new bodies. So you might die at a hundred years old on this, on this earth, but when you get your new body, uh, you'll be like Jesus. So you'll be in your thirties, you'll be in your prime the rest of eternity. No back aches, no knee joints going or anything like that. No cataracts, it's gonna be great. But um, I wanna continue the theme of small but valued. And we looked at that last week, small but valued. And, and so often we try to impress others. We try to um, inflate ourselves a little bit to make ourselves look good and, and come across well to others. And I talked about Gemma Collins and uh, what's he called? Um, I always forget his name. <laughs> Russell Brand. Two real big characters, two big celebrities and uh, hard working people as well. Uh, and funny at times and, and uh, you, you know, they've, they've got a lot going on in their life and they're, they're in the media a lot. And so they have big lives. And I, I love big lives. You know that, anybody that knows me. I love big churches. I do love big. In, um, but, you know, that life, the celebrity life, is not reality. They will tell you that. I saw a quote this week by Jim Carrey that I thought was very telling. Jim Carrey, the comedian and the actor. Um, and he said, I wish everybody would... Uh, become millionaires. I wish everybody would, would find the success that they're looking for, only to find that that is not what they're looking for. What he was trying to say is, they've seen the big life and they want that big life, and then he, he just says, but there's no, there's no peace, there's no satisfaction there. Because when you get there, it's not what you think. It doesn't satisfy what's on the inside. Jesus said it, he said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but his soul remains impoverished? You see, you can stuff the whole world into your soul and it's not big enough to satisfy it. Only Jesus can satisfy it. Was it René Descartes, the philosopher that says, we have a God-shaped gap in our life and only Jesus can, can, can bring true fulfillment to our hearts and our lives. And that's why we talk about Jesus a lot. We're very proud of him and we honour him. He is the son of God. Uh, he's also God, the son. But that takes a little bit to get your head round. But when you realise that the fullness of God lived in Jesus, you realise he wasn't just a man, but he was definitely a man. He ate, he drank and he slept because he got hungry, he got tired and he got thirsty like the rest of us. But he was more than a man. He was God the Son. And he was like the undercover boss coming to planet Earth. And when he saw people, he wanted them to know their value. Because people put labels on you in life. Unemployed. Disabled. Disabled. Invalid. Invalid. Uh, divorced. Gay. Uh, whatever. It, just, it goes on and on and on. And uh, people just want to put their labels on you. Financial labels. How much do you earn? Well, you're only in that much. You're in that bracket. 
What car do you drive? What's your, what's your postcode? Where do you live? And people want to, they want to box us and they want to value us or devalue us. And so Jesus comes and uh, he came as a baby in a manger. Absolutely incredible. Small, but value. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. You might have had a rubbish beginning in your life. Not everyone has a great start in life. And you might even feel that life has diminished you already. And I, I want to bring good news to you and say, but you are valued. And the one who says you are valued, you never diminish in value. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. And so I want to have a look at small, but valued. You know, um, in, in recent years, I think it was either last year, beginning January last year or the year before, I was in Tanzania and I was at a youth uh, event and uh, the church leaders had all come together as hundreds and hundreds of, of young people um, and there were bands on, different bands coming on and they were brilliant rappers and all this lot and then uh, uh, it went on too long so the organiser leaned across to me and said Dave can you bring a, a gospel message in five minutes I said you are looking at a, a trained man fear not my friend I will deliver the goods. I said, five minutes, you cheeky thing. I said, of course I will. And uh, I managed to get hold of, uh, of uh, uh, 10,000 shillings. Let's call it, let's call it 10 pounds or 20 pounds. 10 pounds, I think it is. Because I, I, I wanted to give it like a 10 pound note uh, to somebody that day. So I got up and, and uh, I knew I had five minutes and so the clock was ticking. So I got up, I said, today I'm going to give £10. Does anybody want it? All these young kids, yeah, I want it, I want it. And, and uh, so I got hold of it and I, I screwed it up. And I said, now then, who wants that £10? And yeah, I want it, I want it. I go, so who wants it? Yeah, I want it, I want it. So I un unraveled it and I threw it on the floor and I stood on it and, I, and, I, and I, I rubbed it into the floor. And then I picked it up and I said, who still wants this? Dirty, screwed up, ten pound no, 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 no. Uh, they're all going, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah. We still want it, and uh, so I got hold of it and I wiped it underneath my armpit like that, and I said, who wants it now? Every hand was still up. I want it, I want it. I'm going, why do you want it? He said, I want it, I want it, and I just said, I'll tell you why you want it. I said, you want it because no matter how screwed up. I, no matter how dirty it is, it's been in the gutter. No matter how, <laughs> how many horrible places it's been in, it hasn't lost its value. It's still worth 10,000 Tanzanian shillings. And, uh, and I gave it, and I, I often when I, I do this, I give it to somebody and I, I bring a message from God just to that one person. And it's awesome. And uh, so I'm... Uh, 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 you know, I wanted to, to uh, then apply that to, to the young people. I was saying, your life is like that £10,000, £10,000 shilling note. And that is, you have not diminished, no matter where you've been, no matter how dirty your life has got, no matter the bad places you've had to be in, no matter uh, how screwed up your life has been because they've had bad decisions, either by you or other people. I said, you're still worth Jesus going to the cross. And dying for your sins. He saw value in you. And he said, I am going to die for you. So that you can become everything that God wants you to be. And more than that. To have a life that honours God. And more than that. To have eternal life. Forever and ever. And you know, that's our message. But I'm just saying, small, but valued. And, you know, life can diminish us. You know, we make choices in life and we look back and we regret. And so many people live a life, uh, you know, your front, your front window uh, of your car is bigger than your rear view mirror. Why? Because we're, we were intended to look forward in life, not look back. And too many of us live life in our rear view mirror, looking at what could have been, what should have been. And, and, and then living with the guilt and the dissatisfaction that that brings and the, and the shame and the unfulfilled dreams that you've had. And I want to say, let it go. 
in the words of that song from Frozen, let it go. You've got to let it go because there's nothing you can do about it. And if you will let it go, you've got a future. And you know what? Some of those thoughts make you feel valueless, devalued. And I want to look today at life itself comes and strips away uh, good things, comes and strips away uh, and chews around the area of our value so that we feel like we are worthless. And I want to say, you might look like you've got a small life now, you might have a small life now, but God's plan is to multiply you, is to give you increase in your life, increase in your personality, increase in your character, increase in your finances, increase in your influence with others, increase in your happiness, increase in your peace, increase in your effectiveness as a human being, as a mom, a dad, a son, a daughter, increase. God is so positive and so will you be. When you give your life to him, when you start to operate in the principles of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven has come. Repent, change your thinking and believe the good news. Believe the things that Jesus said. You know, a sparrow. Matthew chapter 10, talking about sparrows. In the context of mission and going reaching the lost, Jesus said this to his disciples, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Quite easy in some cases. <laughs> and he said, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You are worth more than many sparrows. And he was teaching that to his disciples, future church planters. He was telling it to them. And, and he was saying to the sparrows, he's not talking about eagles that were magnificent with a big life, a wingspan of however many metres, three metres, is it? Uh, are big hawks. He's talking about insignificant little sparrows that are not sold for a lot of money. They're sold for a, a few pennies. And he said, but not even one of them that seems so small and insignificant falls to the ground without your heavenly father clocking it. And how much, how much more than sparrows are you and I worth? And then further back, let me just show you in uh, Matthew 6, I think it is, where um, Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about what uh, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Jesus goes right to the heart of things. Look at the birds of the air. They do not work out sowing and reaping and then storing in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? Have you heard that? Are you not much more valuable than them? Next time you see the birds, next time you see the flowers, don't just look and, or walk past and ignore them. Just look and remember you're more valuable than them. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to, to his life? Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. <laughs> We're writing poetry in a minute. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his designer clothes was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, or you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, uh, what shall we wear? And he says, your father knows that you know them. You are worth more than flowers and, and, and sparrows and stuff. You are valuable. You are made in God's image. God's stamp is on you and me. Small and valuable. We often inflate our lives, you know, it's, it's, it's no longer Dave Short, it's Dave Short M.A. <coughs> or doctor, such and such a body. We just have ways, don't we, of, of you know, it, uh, making our lives look bigger. 
<coughs> far more than what we are. But we don't need to. We just need to enjoy our life. We are valuable to God. So I want to have a look this week at how life itself can strip away the, the abundance that God has given you or that God wants for you. Life has a way of stripping it away. You know, even the story of the demoniac. The demoniac was a man who um, was lived in graveyards and he was violent and vile. And, and he, 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 rebelled. he was such a rebel, nobody could, could, could control him. His parents couldn't, local police couldn't, the council couldn't. The council chained him with iron chains, the Bible says, and he snapped them. That's supernatural demonic power. That's not normal power. And when Jesus got to him, Jesus went over the lake with his disciples intentionally to reach one man. This is how valuable this man was. He was despised by everybody. He was feared by everybody. It was a no-go area. They could have called him El Chapo or something like that because he was dangerous. Nobody went past that way. Jesus went purposely that way. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was leading him to release somebody from the power of Satan and from the power of darkness, from the power of smallness. Because that's what Satan wants to do. He does, he never gives, he only wants to take from you. He dazzles young people, does Satan, with, he lures them into places and he just, you, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, go to this nightclub, yeah, look at them, they're having a great time. I'm, I'm just, just drop a few tablets, that's fine, you're gonna have a great night. Get a few beers down your neck, you know, and, and, and you know, you, of course you must sleep with somebody. How exciting and fun, and uh, you know, life is. And there's truth in what he's saying, but it's not the whole truth. You know, the Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a while, but then sin lets you down, and it comes knocking on your door because the wages of sin, wages, you come for the wages. Sin's been at work in your life. It comes from its wages. And uh, its wages are guilt. Its wages are shame. Its wages are a diminished life. And what Satan promises you is a glowing life, an, an awesome life. You don't even have to work at it. How beautiful is that? And as young people, we get sucked into it. And I did as a young kid. And I'm here to say, you, you, you know, that we're bigger than that. And um, when, when, you know, young people from my church go into a nightclub, we train them how to handle the nightlife. We train them. And, uh, you know, because we're going to enjoy great things in this life. And I'm not talking about sin. There's nothing sinful about dancing. Nothing sinful about going to a nightclub. Nothing sinful about having a cheeky beer. But you know what? When stuff has us, that's when it becomes bad for us. So we, know, we need to know how to handle it. And uh, all, all I want to say is that this man, this demoniac, had rebelled against every command that had come his way. The Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And this man was full of demons. Jesus asked him his name and he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And then they spoke this un the unruly bunch that were on the inside of this man. And they said, have you come to deal with us? If you're going to cast us out, cast us into them pigs. Let us go into them pigs, Jesus. And Jesus said, he gave him permission because he had authority over evil spirits. And he gave them permission. And those pigs ran and committed suicide. 3,000 of them fell off the edge of a cliff. That's the end result of what happens when Satan, the evil king of this world, the invisible king, when he whispers in your ear, that's the end result. He wants to, he's come to kill, steal and destroy, Jesus said. In John chapter 10, verse 10, kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to steal your youth. He wants to rob you of your potential. He wants to kill your faith in God and goodness. Yeah, he does. And Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and life in all its fullness. But do you know Jesus today? You can get to know him. Come with your life. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know this that the demoniac was naked and bleeding. He was self-harming. He was mentally all over the show. His mental health was in his boots. It was rock bottom. Plus he had demons. 
And he said that when the country people came out, because they'd heard of what, what had gone on, they saw the demoniac sat at Jesus' feet, dressed, clothed, and in his right mind. That's what happens when you give your life to Jesus. Your life turns around. Your thinking gets straightened out and everything else follows. Once you've got your thinking straightened out, everything else follows and Jesus sets us on a course for success, a course for increase, not diminishing our lives, but increasing our lives. I want to have a look at a woman today. I've, I don't have long, but uh, I want to have a, a look at a woman in the Bible and her story is amazing because many, many people are not born with a silver spoon in the mouth. Many people, for many people, life is tough. Even if you are born with a silver spoon in your mouth, there are things that you have to, to get your head around. We're hearing all about Prince Harry and Meghan at this time, and Prince Harry born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Do you think he's had it easy? I don't think he's had it easy. And he, he, was, he was saying to James Corden the other night, you know, my mental health was affected by the press. And uh, they've got things to answer for of the press. But you know, just because he was born into privilege doesn't mean he hasn't got to fight some demons. Yes, he has. And so have you and so have I. But making choices and wrong choices in life hurts us. Maybe we don't cut ourselves like the demoniac, but the, the choices that we make hurt us. And we, we believe the sweet talking guy. I'm thinking of you girls now, you believe the sweet talking guy. And you, you know, he's playing the field and you know that he's an unfaithful bum. And yet you, you get involved with him, then you end up with his kid. And all you're left with, if you're lucky, is a band of gold. If you're lucky, if you're not lucky, you don't even get that. And you, you know, this is not, I'm not condemning nobody at all. But what I'm saying is, these are choices in our life. Some of you, you know, you've been the, the, the party animal. Now you can't stop taking drugs. Now you can't, the drink has got you. And you're losing your job because you can't hold a job down. I'm just saying, maybe you've, you've, you can't, be, you, all your life, you've never, ever been able to submit to authority. And you're losing job after job after job because you can't submit to your boss. I don't have to put up with this. Shove your job up your backside. Shove your job where the sun don't shine. Don't we love phrases like that? And yet we walk out of a job. The one person that's suffering is who? Yourself. It's not always other people. It's what we do to ourselves sometimes. But sometimes it is what other people have done to us. There's a great song that we sing in church and it says, Your mercy found me upon a broken road and lifted me, lifted me beyond my failings. I want that kind of love in my life, don't you? God stoops down from heaven in his son to scoop up mankind and to raise us back up to the standard that he created in the Garden of Eden. God wants to work in your life. We're free to fail, but we're empowered to win. How great is that? Free to fail, but empowered to win. No condemnation in the kingdom of heaven. Let me just go through this woman's story. It's in Luke chapter 7. Uh, starting at verse 50, uh, 36. And it's a story of a, uh, a meeting with Jesus and some religious guys, the Pharisees. They were the top religious people in their, in, in, in their religion. Uh, and, and they're intense. And they're, they're about, you know, getting everything right on the outside. And, uh, you know, if you know anything about Jesus, he challenges as to what we're like on the inside our motives and our love for people. But these, the Pharisees, they were, they were hard work really and truly and they had no mercy and they showed no mercy and they looked down their noses at everybody and yet they invited Jesus to come for a meal and Jesus went and uh, he knew that he was going into hostile territory. Pardon me. And it says this, now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And, and what, they, what they did is they leaned forward and their legs were out at the back. And so they would, they would be in a circle so they could chat and eat at the same time. And their smelly feet were out at the back. But usually the tradition was, the custom was that you, anybody came into your house and got their feet washed by a servant and dried so that they were refreshed and they, didn't, they weren't smelly and dusty and everything. Um, 
But anyway, Jesus went to dinner with the, the Pharisee and they reclined at the table when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says that uh, long hair is a woman's honour and glory. She took her glory and she wiped Jesus' feet with something that made her look beautiful and, 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 and glorified her, enhanced her. She took hold of it and wiped Jesus' feet with it. She wanted to bring in honour. Something had gone on in her life that Jesus had affected her. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. That she is a sinner. That's all he could think of. She can't keep God's law. That's what a sinner was. She can't keep God's law. And so she's just gone and done her own thing. And her life was colourful. And I think she started life as a bold character and a, and a force of human nature. Because even in her brokenness, she walked into a room where she would know that she was the outcast and she didn't care. There was a pain in her heart that was greater than what people thought of her. And that was my story. I knew I needed forgiveness and I couldn't find it. I knew my life needed to change and I was powerless to change. I ended up in hospital having had a seizure, an epileptic fit because of me drinking. And I knew I treated people badly and I could not change. I couldn't see a way forward. And Jesus touched my life. And when, when his touch comes upon your life, it's invisible, but it's powerful. And you know it, I felt clean. Jesus never diminishes you, he only adds to. And he gave me life in all its fullness and I'm still discovering it. And this woman had been touched by the life of Jesus and something had gone wrong. I think she'd gone back into her old ways and it wasn't working out for her. She thought, I can't do it anymore. I've tasted something that's different. And she was coming back to Jesus to see if there was any more forgiveness left. But maybe I'm speaking to somebody today and you've blown it. Within your Christian faith, you've blown it. You've met a right mess. Maybe you've met a big splash. And I want to say, do not worry about what people think of you. Come to Jesus. Let the pain in your heart drive you to Jesus. Do not worry what other people think of you. All Simon the Pharisee saw was a sinner. And Jesus turned to him and said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a money lender. One owed him 500,000 pounds. The other owed him 50 pounds. The man cancelled the debts of both of them. Now, which of them will love him the most? And Simon said, I suppose he's all irritated. I suppose he didn't want to join in the story. He knew Jesus was going somewhere with this story. And it, it, it was apparent. And he's just saying, I suppose the one who was, who was at the biggest debt and it was cancelled. And Jesus said, you have judged correctly. Then he turned towards the woman and he said, Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house, by the way, Simon didn't see a woman. He saw a prostitute. He saw, he saw somebody that's like the muck under his shoe. That's what he saw. He diminished her. He wanted to make her look small. He couldn't have any greater thought about that woman because he looked at her lifestyle and said, she is that. Jesus looked at her lifestyle and he said, she's not that. She's made in God's image. And in Genesis, when, he, when the Bible says that God created man and woman, it says it was man and woman, not man and prostitute, not man and clog iron, not, you know, even for a man, not idiot and man, no. It was a man and it was a woman and that was the standard. And we had God's stamp on us right then. And just like that 10,000 shilling note that I wiped under me, my armpits chucked on the floor and stood on and screwed up. 
We've messed up in life, every one of us, and this woman had. And your life was all screwed up. Her mental health had gone. Her dignity had gone. Everything had gone. And people knew it. You know, it's one thing to be able to hold it all in. And, you know, like a like a, a, a functioning alcoholic, you can just hold it together. But inside you are dying. This woman, nothing left. She had no barrier. She just let all the barriers were down and she didn't care anymore. She'd hit rock bottom. You mercy found me. Upon a broken road and rescued me beyond my failings. You are not your sin. You're not. You are made in God's image. And so are your family. Think about your family. You say, well, I'm a Christian, Dave. Think about your family. Think about your friends that don't know him. That are being diminished constantly by whether it's life or the devil or whatever. Think about them. We need to introduce them to Jesus. And Jesus is here in this story. I've got to finish. He said, Do you see this woman, Simon? I came into your house and you did not give me water for my feet. You didn't even do the customary things of washing my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss on my cheek, the customary kiss of welcome. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing, not my cheek, but my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, Loves little. What's your heart like? Are you big hearted? Have you been forgiven a lot? I've been forgiven a lot. You know, some people have said to me, well, I've never lived your kind of life, Dave. So, you know, it's not as dramatic. I think they're wrong. Because I think the more you get to know Jesus, the more you realise how sinful you are. My sins were sins of the flesh. Everybody could see my drunkenness and my immorality. But you know what? I've met people in churches good living people but behind that they've been the facade it's been a facade and the sins of jealousy the sins of envy the sins of hatred the sins of condemning other people looking down the nose at other people they're the sins the sins of bitterness they're the sins that nobody can see sins of the soul what about you sins of the soul the more you get to realize and you forgive you you crumb he forgave you. Yes, you never committed adultery. You never got drunk. I'm not having a go at you, but I'm wobbling. I'm shaking your tree and wobbling your head and saying, the more you get to know Jesus, that he's interested in your motivation and your thinking and not just your actions. That's when you realise, I need a saviour. I am a sinful man. I'm a sinful woman. No, I've never taken a drug in my life, but you know what? I'm as low as anything because of me. Thought life. My attitude. You're like the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. You've let the reckless thinking of your mind take over you and you need to repent. Honestly, the more you get to know Jesus, it's fantastic. You realise you've been forgiven a lot. You have. Jesus turned to the woman and he said to her, your sins are forgiven. That's what she'd come for. She'd come for reassurance. Am I so forgiven, Jesus? I've I was following you and then I fell away. I'm coming back, is there anything for me? Maybe that's you today. And I'm saying, yes, there is. When the forgiveness you find today is like a teaspoonful in an ocean of more forgiveness whenever you want it. It's full and free for every one of us. I'm a bit emotional today. I don't know why it's that. Maybe it's that time of but these stories touch my heart. These are not just stories. These are real people's lives that are recorded for us so that we, we can learn what God's like, what Jesus is like. I have to finish. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? They still, still missed it. Religious people often miss it. They miss the point. But what they were worrying, were, were trying to work out is, who is this? Who is this? 
And Jesus is not just the Son of God, he is God the Son. Their God has come amongst them, as was predicted in the Old Testament scriptures. And this is what God is like. You can trust him with your life, with your emotions. You can trust him. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's what she'd come. She'd come all churned up and she's leaving Jesus in peace. Go, the, the Greek word there, the emphasis is go into peace. But he put the emphasis on her, your faith. You see, you're small, but you're not insignificant. Even your faith, small faith, affects heaven. Heaven will come to your rescue. Why? Because you're worth it. You are worth it. There's a worth on your life because you're made in God's image. Wow, I've got to finish. I can't get on to my third point. But every week we give people a chance to give their life to Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. And he wants to forgive your sins and make you right with God, his heavenly father. And once that happens, he's when he's your heavenly father, he's got, always got a jingle in his pocket. He's always got a smile on his face for you. I tell you, your future becomes bright. I'm using human illustration, but you get my point. Come with us and we will do you good. Give your life to Jesus, you'll get eternal life starting now. And the quality of your life will change. Let's bow our heads and pray. Today God calls you to himself. And if you, if you want to say yes to him like this woman in the story, like the demoniac, if you're saying yes to Jesus, you can amen this prayer. Amen means I agree. And in doing that, you're saying, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross to pay the price for my sin, which was death, a debt that I couldn't afford. And you've paid it and three days later you rose again, demonstrating that you've got power over sin, Satan, sickness and death. And now today I give my life to you and I want to follow you for the rest of my life. I open the door of my heart to you. Will you give me your Holy Spirit? And, and fill me with the, the, the presence of God and with the power to follow you in Jesus' name. If you've said that prayer, get in touch with us. And maybe if you're listening in from different parts of the country and the rest of the world, you know, get in touch with us about planting churches. We've got to reach people. We want to reach people. So we, we, we need your help to reach people. I want to plant a thousand churches. That's 10 churches in a in a hundred cities throughout this world, ten a hundred major cities, and in each of them cities, ten churches. Will you help me? Get involved and get in touch with us. Thank you for tuning in and, and connecting with us this week. And uh, be, you know, get, get get in touch with us. There's things going on during the week in Zoom and dinner parties and different things. But get ready to come again next week. Next week, I want to look at how. God strips things away from our lives. That's important. Things that we all dear, but He says they're not even they're not useful to us. And so, come, you know, this week we've been looking at you know life stripping away things. But next week we're going to look at God stripping away, and then we're going to look at how God just puts things together, gets us on the right track. It's beautiful. Thank you so much for today. I love you. Keep safe, and I'll see you later. Stay.